Okay, let's get started. So, at the beginning here, the beginning portion of the course is going to be, okay, I'll wander around, but then they can't see over here. Okay, whatever. Um, um, just record the TV that's recording it. Oh, that is so, that is, <laughs> that is so analog, I just can't know if I can hear it. <laughs> Plus it like goes infinitely into the distance there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the beginning part of the course, um, sort of the first month, month and a half or so, is going to be sort of like, you know, Phys 211 on steroids, okay? This is the stuff that we would like to have taught everyone in Phys 211, but that we couldn't because there were, you know, too many chemistry majors in there and engineers and people that probably couldn't handle it, okay? So the beginning part of here is going to be a little bit scattershot as we take, oh, hey, here's this concept that you learned to one level in Phys 211, and we're going to sort of take it to the next level here, but we're not going to re recap what happened in Phys 211. I figure you guys are going to figure that out. Um, so if there is something that you really truly didn't understand, didn't get into 11, then let me know. We can cover it. Um, but for the most part, the plan is to just go ahead and start it on the new stuff, and, and we'll figure it out as we go. So chapter two, um, for which we're going to spend three different lectures uh, tonight, Wednesday, and Friday, and then you have a homework on chapter two due, due next Friday. Um, is about uh, sort of different um, interesting solutions to the F equals MA problem that you, or at a level that we probably didn't get to in Physics 211. So we're going to start off uh, today and Wednesday talking about air resistance and drag, and then we were going to get on Friday to talking about um, motion uh, in a magnetic field. And all of this is going to involve differential equations. Who has seen, who has taken differential equations yet? Okay. Who has not? Oh, you all have. Oh, I wish everyone else were here. Have you guys seen it? Okay. Um, that is that is tremendously simplifying for me. Um, so I may skip the uh, differential equations for physics majors bit that I usually give, or maybe I'll do that on Wednesday morning. And I'll assume that you guys have seen that stuff before. It has been a while, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, there's only two different ones that I'm maybe three that I'm going to show you guys, right? It's either, the answer is either going to be e to the x or sine x, okay? Those are the two. Those are the two, all right? Um, it's either the function's equal to some function of its derivative or its second derivative is equal to some function of it. Um, in both cases, you're going to get either exponentials or negative ex or uh, imaginary exponentials, which are sine functions. So there you go. Um, so it's not as complicated as like general differential equations. There's, there's a really, uh, and on an exam or anything, I am not gonna give you a differential equation that you have not absolutely seen before, either in class or in a homework, and it's just gonna be a matter of, you know, of, of knowing the answer and, and showing that it's right. So it shouldn't be too bad. All right, so talking about the forces of drag. So imagine you've got, um, start with the coordinate system. And we've got some object moving in a given direction with a velocity v. The drag, the force that acts on that body, uh, owing to uh, interaction with the air, is going to push it always in the opposite velo uh, direction of the velocity. But let's do a free body diagram on this thing. Whatever it is, it's a baseball or something flying through the air. What forces are acting on it then if drag is one of them? We got drag and gravity. Okay. So we got a force down here of the weight, which is equal to mg. And we have the force of drag, let's call it FD. It's going to always point in the opposite direction of the velocity. And that opposite direction of the velocity bit is going to be both helpful and useful and a, a super huge pain depending on what exactly uh, kind of drag we're going to talk about. So there are two primary um, types of drag or formulations of drag that we're going to talk about. Um, the full force of drag is we're going to look at it. It's going to be, it's always in the opposite direction of the velocity, okay? So it's always going to be negative v hat. Drag always slows you down. It does not speed you up. That would be a neat trick. 
<laughs> well, I guess it could speed you up, right? What if you're you toss the ball straight up in a wind tunnel where you have wind blowing? Okay, then it is kind of going to speed you up. But um, assuming v is the velocity relative to the fluid, it does not speed you up. So in that case, um, the force of drag is equal to negative beta d times v plus gamma v squared times v squared. Okay, so there's two different terms. And the two different terms are coming from two different physical processes. So that's the origin here. So on the left here, you have the linear term, or the viscous term. And that arises from fluid dynamics. OK, that's you have a BB falling through the water or whatever, right? Okay, and the water is flowing around it, and you have laminar flow. Um, and everything's moving nice and smoothly, that tends to go where the force of drag is proportional to the velocity. And that's sort of the easier case to calculate analytically, so we're going to do a lot of that. Uh, even though the more maybe useful case uh, is the other case over here, the quadratic case. And this is the pressure term. This would occur even if you didn't have anything flowing out of the way at all. Okay? So the way to think of this term is, imagine you just have a cloud of 10 to the 23 point masses. They're all sitting there. Okay? And your baseball is flying through all those point masses. As it goes through each point mass, it's gonna, there's going to be a collision. Okay? Right? And who all saw collisions in Phys 211? You all saw collisions? Mm -hmm. Gunner did, I know. Okay. That's the only one I know. Okay. You should have seen collisions. If you have a collision between a very massive object and a very low mass object, in any collision, if you do the collision in the center of mass frame, of course, remember, you may not have learned this, but I've talked about this, and at the center of mass frame, everything goes in, it bounces off, and it comes right back out, okay? If you have a baseball and a nitrogen molecule, the center of mass is pretty much the speed the, at the baseball, okay? It's not in the nitrogen molecule. So in this frame of reference, you've got a nitrogen molecule coming in, and when it, after the collision, it's going to bounce off and it's going to head off with the same velocity, okay? And that velocity is going to be the relative velocity between the ball and, in this case, the air, okay? So that accounts for one of these Vs, okay? Every collision you have with an air molecule, it's going to bounce that air molecule off at the same velocity that you're hitting it at, on average. I mean, in reality, of course, the air molecules are all moving around, and they're moving, some are moving faster and some are moving slower, but on average, this is still true. The other V comes in about because the faster you're going, the more air molecules you hit each second, right? Okay, if you're going twice as fast, you're gonna core out a cone or a, a, a tunnel of air molecules, or you're gonna hit twice as many air molecules in a given amount of time. And so one of these Vs come about because you because of each individual collision, and one of them comes about come, uh, due to the total number of collisions. We have these little coefficients going on. The D here is the diameter. So this is the diameter of the body you're looking at. Um, interestingly, Notice you have a d squared term over here, but only a d over here. What's going on with that? Okay. In the quadratic pressure drag, right, the, the, the number, once again, the number of air molecules you hit depends on the cross-sectional area of the object you're throwing. Okay, if you throw a softball, it's gonna have more area, it's gonna hit more things. So hence the d squared. But linear drag does not have that. Why not? It's because in laminar flow, as you're moving around and you have the object visco or the uh, fluid viscously flowing around, it only has to go a distance d on average, right, to get from the middle out and then back in. So it's not an aerial term; it's this linear term. Weird. It's different. Okay. What's first in each of these cases is a coefficient, and this is the fudge factor. Okay. So like, not everything with the same diameter um, is going to have the same amount of drag. Um, and so this is going to be, the, you know, in this case, the drag coefficient. 
And what do we what do I call it for uh, the linear term? Did I write it down? Yeah. Um, this coefficient gamma for air um, has three parts of it. Um, oh, I have that in there twice. The A cross sectional area is in there twice in the letters there. Just one. Um, it's proportional to the density of the air. Or this works for water too, right? If you're going fast through water. Um, but the density of the air in this case is, or in the case of the Earth, is 1.29 kilograms per meter cubed. But that's the Earth at sea level at standard temperature and pressure. Kappa is a factor um, accounting for the how smooth your, your object is that's moving through the air. Okay, And it's, this coefficient is 0.25 for a sphere. So imagine you're trying to minimize drag on a car. How can you do it? Make it smoother? Make it smoother? Right. So make it more streamlined. That will reduce this factor. What else could you do? Make it smaller? Yeah. Reduce the cross-sectional area. So if you make it like sort of a long, thin, pencil-like car. What else could you do? I like it. I hadn't thought of that one. That's good. Yeah. The higher you are, or you're on the moon or something, or driving you around on Mars, less less air resistance. Of course, the other thing you can do is go slower. Okay. So that's a big factor. So you guys are going to learn this eventually because I talk about it all the time. So I'm just going to get started. Okay. Like I have an electric car. And Gunnar will tell you I'm obsessed with it. I talk about it all the time. All right. I'm obsessed with this drag thing, okay? Because if I'm driving my car and my computer says I'm not gonna make it to my destination, this V squared kills you. Don't go 80. If you don't go 80 on the freeway, if you just go 60, you will save, you know, almost a third of your drag just by slowing down that 20 miles an hour. And you'll make it in a way that you wouldn't normally. Um, and so, because, right, uh, the total amount of energy you lose due to drag is equal to force times distance, okay? So, like, if you're going one mile at 60 miles an hour versus one mile at 80 miles an hour, you use more energy going 80 miles an hour for that same mile because of the V squared term. So, if you want to go the same distance but use less energy, you go slower. So, if you ever see me driving along, at 25 miles an hour with my flashers on it, it means, oh my gosh, I'm totally on electron fumes. Um, usually that usually doesn't happen because I got a lot of range, but um, I admit, I did that last winter. My car got in a wreck, Some, someone hit it. And so I bought an old Nissan Leaf just to, just to uh, for the three months while the car was getting fixed, okay? And those things, those things have very small batteries, okay? Those things, that thing, first of all, it's old and its battery was degraded. So its total battery capacity was about 16 kilowatt hours, 15 kilowatt hours. Anyway, in my Tesla, when I have that much, that's when I think I'm almost out, okay? That's full in this car. So and it was in the middle of winter. These things do bad in the winter. The density of air is higher in the winter. The battery has been worse, worse effectivity in the winter. Nothing worked well. I can't use the heater. I was, I was literally driving back from smoke can it at like 25 miles an hour. It was really embarrassing. Okay. Uh, but I made it. I made it. I pulled in, but I made it. Um, this geometry factor, yeah, you want to build a, a you know, a streamlined car. Uh, prefer, preferably, you probably don't want the mirrors sticking out. Unfortunately, um, they don't, the government doesn't let us not do that anymore. So that's too bad. Elon wants to put like cameras on there and just have it, you know, little displays inside because he can basically get the same range with a smaller battery or longer range with the same battery if you don't have those stupid things sticking out because they're so, uh, first of all, they increase the area and they, they're, they're, they're weird shape. Um, so electric cars have really done this to an ex uh, the greatest degree is to reduce this factor because batteries are expensive. <laughs> like streamlining your car is really cheap and what people care about is like how far you can go in it, not just necessarily how big the battery is. So um, the very lowest coefficient cars are at something like 
0.22, 0.23. Um, it's like really good. Like a Hummer is at like 0.4. It's basically, <laughs> they're like driving around a brick, basically. There's like no rounding at all. It's just like, poof, just brute force straight through the air. Just will move those molecules out of the way. So you'll, um, but you can, you can gain a factor of, you know, 20 or 30% better um, improvement just based on this alone. Okay. So, which of these is important? Well, um, as you might imagine, these B, sorry, the D term being squared in one versus the other means it's going to be much more important for large objects. The, this term, the quadratic pressure drag, which is also called Newton drag, is more important. So larger objects tend to have this term. Faster objects, this term is more important. Okay? For small and slow objects, the viscous Stokes drag tends to be more important. And I have some examples here. We just take the ratio of quadratic drag to linear drag for various different cases. Um, for a baseball, Ratio is maybe 600. Okay, so this is a, we're in a v squared regime here. You throw in an EFIS pitch at 55 miles an hour versus a fastball at 100 miles an hour, you're going to have almost double the uh, quadruple the drag at 100 miles an hour versus 50. Okay. For a raindrop on Earth, it's me, so I have to specify that. It's about one. Okay. So raindrops are partially having the air flow around them and partially having, uh, partially snow plowing the air out of the way. And of course, this is what allows, this is what drives them into that funny shape. Is this is a, a combination of those two. Um, in fact, the front tends to be a little flattened uh, owing to the snow plow drag. And then the tail develops because of the uh, Stokes part, the, the, the viscous um, motion of the air around it. Uh, in fact, if you look at raindrops at very high speed in a high speed camera, you'll find that they're not static. They don't look like that all the time. They're kind of moving around. They're kind of on this active like, thing going on. On Titan, of course, the air density is four times higher than Earth's. The gravity is seven times lower. And so what you get is very big raindrops like this, really fat raindrops that move kind of slow, move down really slowly. You can see them. I mean, on Earth, it's kind of hard to see them because they'll drop right there, all coming down. Um, on Titan, if we were to see it rain, and I hope we do, um, the engineers probably don't, but I hope we see it rain. Um, it should be really cool. It should be like weird drops. We'll see them moving and flowing as, you, as they move down really slowly. And they'll be pretty macroscopic. They should be big, easy to see. Um, part of what sets the size of the raindrops is um, this process, right? If, if you have a very large raindrop on Earth, it's sort of moving around and it'll, it'll, it'll bifurcate, it'll split into two bits and then, then it'll continue to come down. Um, but on Earth, raindrops are really hard because they're in this in-between regime. Howdy. All right, let's take a, let's take a brief intermission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's two more than I thought I got, but that's okay. I thought I had five. I thought it, I thought it seemed a little expensive. All right, I'm going to put these on the back, maybe, and let's take a break. Maybe I'll get up and come grab some food. I do not need to get do that for the others as needed.
over. We'll continue. Um, for very small objects, like um, dust in the atmosphere, or a cloud particulate, which are also raindrops, sort of, but you know they're not as big. Um, so for very small uh, objects sitting through the air, um, it might have a, a, a ratio of quadratic to linear drag of maybe 10 to the minus 7. Um, the example I, hear, I have here is the Millikan oil drop from the Millikan oil drop experiment. Who has heard of the Millikan oil drop experiment? Who has not heard of the Millikan oil drop experiment? Okay. So um, I was an undergraduate at Caltech where Millikan did the oil drop experiment, so they always tried to show it to us. Um, basically, this is the experiment that determined what the ch individual charge on an electron was. And the way they did it is they had a little spritzer that spritzed um, very fine oil into the air. And then you had a charged plate at the bottom. They knew what the charge on the bottom was. And so if any of the oil drops, as they were being spritzed down, had a little bit of friction, and they had an electron pulled off of them, they would develop a, 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 a negative charge, a very slight negative charge. And then they got to a given distance from the plate, they would hover there. Um, if they had one electron, essentially they had a charge of negative one electron on the whole oil drop. Anyway, but as those things were flying through the air themselves, they had much more linear drag than quadratic drag. And so treating them was more of a Stokes problem and less of a, of a quadratic pressure problem. So to refer to this ratio, we usually refer to that as the Reynolds number, R, um, which is defined as dv rho, dv rho over eta. Where did eta come from? That was that term. What are the terms? Viscosity the is part of beta? Is that what's going on? Eta. Yeah, I have not, yes, you're right. You're exactly correct. It's in my notes, which I did not talk about over there, but I should have. Yeah, so this uh, function of the viscosity, that is the viscosity of the fluid. So the Reynolds number is essentially the same as this ratio of quadratic to the linear portion. So an object moving through the air that has a very high Reynolds number will have mostly quadratic drag and a minority of viscous drag, whereas something with a very low Reynolds number will be mostly viscous drag. And something in the middle, these are of course the hardest parts to model because you have to do both, right? If it's 10 to the minus 7, or a thousand, you can pretty much ignore the, the other term and just deal with one term and you'll be safe. But if it's sort of near one, you kind of have to deal with both, otherwise you're not gonna get the right answer. Um, and so, for my space mission, Dragonfly, who's heard of it? You can admit if you haven't, who's not heard of it? Okay. No one's gonna, you're not gonna admit you heard of it? Okay, you didn't see real break your hand. Okay, um, so my mission is a quadcopter, a giant quadcopter that we're landing on Titan, which is the moon of Saturn. And in order to test a giant quadcopter, I mean, you can't cool it down to 90 Kelvin and put it in, uh, you know, uh, one and a half bar atmosphere at one seventh gravity, okay? Maybe you could. We're in a big test chamber like on the vomit comet or something. Anyway, <laughs> far too expensive. We can't do that. But what we can do is we can simulate the weight. Okay, we just take off a bunch of components so that it weighs seven times less than it did before. But put a lot of that weight far away from the center of mass so it sort of has the same moment of inertia characteristics as it does before. And then we change the rotors, we change the wings such that they have this is what we try to replicate. You try to replicate the same Reynolds number that the rotors would have on Titan. And that allows us to replicate the conditions and be able to basically test the whole vehicle here on Earth um, out, in the, out, out uh, in, in the normal, in uh, free air conditions, right? Um, much cheaper than the vomit comet, the pr pressurized um, in a liquid nitrogen bath. So, <laughs> It's really, but this is, this is what aerospace engineers always want to replicate. They replicate, you get the right Reynolds number, you're going to get the right aerodynamic behavior that's very similar to what you're looking at. 
Um, and so you don't want to simulate you know, the size of the rotors or how fast they're moving or something. This is, this is the factor that you want to replicate. What am I going to do with my notes? So um, let's take up Margot's suggestion and finish this job here by describing the fudge factor um, on the viscous drag side. So this beta um, is equal to some constants out front. It's mostly the viscosity, but it does have to do with the, the radius or the diameter of the object you're looking at. So this coefficient in front, um, right, more viscous, if you're trying to drop your BB through honey versus air, it's going to have a very different amount of Stokes flow, uh, and it has to do with the viscosity of the stuff you're going through. Um, and that's, the eta here is what comes out. I actually wrote down here what the viscosity of air is. You can use it if you need it. For the most part, I don't think you'll need it. You might, you might. It's here in your notes if you need it. Viscosity of air. Okay. <coughs> Linear air resistance, even though it's only interesting, or it's only useful in like, let's face it, kind of uninteresting conditions, you know, like dust falling through the air, really, a pea falling through honey, okay, yes, you can use this, but like, you know, for objects going like fast, this is the important one, um, and, but it's hard, so I'm going to skip it for now, we're going to look at the other case instead. What's great about the linear case is that it breaks up really easily. So if we're looking at just the linear case, the force of drag then is going to be equal to negative beta d, and then I'm going to write x, the velocity is vx x hat plus vy y hat. which is great. The x component only depends on the x velocity, and the y component only depends on the y velocity. This is what we want uh, because it makes, things, it makes the math far less hairy in the future. Um, we're adding in all of the terms. We also want to add in the force of, or the weight here, the force of gravity, which is equal to negative mg y hat. So if we want to figure out what the motion of this object is. This is the acceler This force tells us what forces are acting on it, right? We want to figure out the motion. We need to translate that into an acceleration. We want to take that force, set it equal to ma, or more likely take a, set it equal to f over m is kind of what we're trying to do here. But I'll just, just leave this for now. Uh, that's going to be equal to then negative beta times d times vx in x hat plus, minus, mg plus beta dvy in y hat. So if we want to solve for the acceleration then, the acceleration is going to be equal to negative beta dvx over m in x minus G minus beta D dy over M in Y hat. If you want to figure out the X acceleration, we just set AX equal to the X component here, equal to negative beta, or oh, I have two Bs, so it's D, D VX over M. Uh, we don't need the x hat anymore. It's gone. All right, so this is technically a first order differential equation, right? Okay, so the acceleration at x, I'm going to rewrite it as dv dt so that I can say that vx is in both sides here. So this is a differential equation. We're saying that. The derivative of vx, the function, whatever it is, is equal to vx 
times some parameter out front. So what is the solution to that differential equation? You have an idea? Well, it's, yeah, it's separable, so you could just move the dt over to the other side, move the dx to the bottom, take the integral. Yep. dv over d, dv over dx. Okay. And then you have natural log in there. Yep. Uh, yeah. So that's how you actually solve differential equations. That's advanced for me. I just know the answer and show that it works, okay? So there's only two kinds of, of differential equations you're going to see. This is one of them. The solution to this is v of x is equal to e to the minus bd over m times v of x, uh, times t. Is that right? Those of you that know more than me? Yeah. I think it's e to something, yeah. <coughs> yeah, because you're going to put the natural one you have to take it. These all have B over M's without the D in it. I'm not sure why that is. All my notes do. You know, I think that this D and this R are the same. So I don't think I need that D. And I should probably know better to know that and not have it over here. I'm just gonna. Or did you, did you make it like negative or beta d a new constant, just little b. I see little b. Is that what he? Is that what? Is that what I did? I think that's because yeah. under your free body diagram, it looks like you have negative beta d. Is equal to, is equal to, to b. Minus okay, good. B. Yeah. But this is still the right answer, and we'll so, just go with that. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Senior. You're right, because b is not beta, obviously, right? So something, yeah, no, something did not come out right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is what I'm positing is the correct function. So let's see if that's true. Let's see if when we take the derivative of this function, does it end up being, being this? So let's do that. Okay. What's the derivative of this then? E to the minus beta d over m times t. Well, it's going to be equal to e to the minus beta d over m times t times this stuff in front of the t out front, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be equal to negative beta d over m, right? So beta d over m times the original function itself, the exponential. Remember, you're better at calculus than me. So if this is not right, tell me now, okay? So in this case, it says the velocity is going to, uh, I'm sorry, the acceleration is going to be uh, continually decreasing. The velocity is going to look like this. It's going to be some exponential decay. <laughs> and it's going to get slower and slower with time, but it never will go to zero, right? So it's going to decay. It's going to get slower and slower, but you will never actually stop if you're just looking at viscous drag. According to this, Vx is always positive. It will always go forward. However, if you integrate Vx, which do you have time? That's right. All right, so if you were to integrate Vx to figure out x as a function of t, what would I need to do? Well, I think I'd need to put a negative m over beta d out front and another negative beta d over m in here, but I'm multiplying by one, basically, right? I can, I can multiply by one, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And then take the integral of vx, which is e to the minus beta d over m times t, t right? So, that integral, once I move this inside the integral, the integral to that would be equal to e to the minus beta d over m times t, I think. In which case, we get negative, we left with negative m over beta d 
e to the minus beta d over m times t plus some constant. Yeah, this is kind of what I got. So depending on what this constant is, right, over time, this is the position, it's going to have this term, which is going to be slowly getting smaller, but never go to zero. Um, well, wait, no, that's not true. It's not going to go exactly to zero, but it's going to get pretty small pretty fast, plus some constant. So because this has a finite integral, this goes, really goes to one point, and this does not go up forever. If, say, you're on the space station, right, okay, you toss a beach ball through the air on the space station, okay, it's going to slow down, it's going to slow down, it's going to slow down. It's never going to quite go to zero speed, but it will approach, it will asymptotically approach one given distance, and it will not go on forever. Isn't that weird? Okay, this is like Zeno's paradox or something, right? Okay, it's always going to be moving, it will never stop, but it will never go further than one given point. So we'll go out to there and you'll never have to, it's not gonna like keep going um, forever through space and time. All right, let's look at why. In why, it's a little bit different, of course, because you've got the gravity term. So, in the y side, the y component of acceleration is going to be equal to negative g minus beta d mu y over m and the y hat. Um, this is probably a plus. Right, because I have the minus out front. They're both minus terms, but they can't. Is that right? <coughs> Depends on the velocity <coughs> direction, huh? Yeah, I think that's right. They're both minus. Yeah, I think they're both minus. Because eventually, right, these are going to equal reach an equilibrium. Did you learn about that in Phys 211, right? When they get to terminal velocity? Who saw terminal velocity in Phys 211? Okay, I think you guys saw that. When they get to velo terminal velocity though, right, dy will be negative because it'll be moving downward. Mm -hmm. So this will again be negative and they will reach terminal velocity when the viscous flow term, in this case, the drag term, beta d dy over m is equal to g or equal to negative g because the dy will be negative as it continues going downward. So the solution to this differential equation is not too different, but it comes out that um, the velocity in y as a function of time is going to be equal to that terminal velocity times 1 minus e to the minus t over some characteristic time scale tau, uh, which is equal to beta d over m. No? Other way. We got that inverted. M over beta times D. Is that right? So the way I check is by looking at the units. I'm obsessed with units. If that's correct, then the units of viscosity are newtons, seconds per meter squared. So this is kilograms over Newtons seconds per meter squared. We're going to D here. We'll take care of one of those. What is a Newton? Kilogram meter per second squared, right? Mm -hmm. Kilograms are going to drop. <coughs> meters are going to drop. One of the seconds is going to drop. This, this will end up in seconds. So that's right. You want an answer, uh, an answer. The tau here is sort of a characteristic time scale over which the uh, <coughs> drag is going to act. Um, and it's going to be longer for a more massive object, right? So a more massive object, everything being this, else being the same, right? A beach ball versus uh, uh, like a bowling ball. The bowling ball is going to take, it's going to slow down over a longer time scale. Um, and similarly, larger objects are going to slow down faster. They'll have a shorter time scale. And higher 
objects going through higher viscosity, the higher viscosity medium are also going to slow down faster. What is that terminal velocity equal to? Well, the acceleration is equal to zero at terminal velocity. So that's negative g plus beta dvy over m is equal to zero. We want to solve this for vy. And in that case, it's equal to g equals m. So vy is going to be equal to mg over beta d. Is that what I have? It's totally not. For that to be negative g plus b d v y over m, wouldn't that have to make No, you're right. The acceleration negative? They're negatives. Because yeah. this is inside the, the parenthesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. So this one's a minus. This is a minus here. This is a minus here, which is mm -hmm. good because now it's going down. So I appreciate that. Um, I think. Where, I don't know where I got the. Oh, this is the quadratic drag. Because there's a square root and there's a gamma in it. The one in my notes. So that's a complicated part. So this was the easy version. <laughs> quadratic drag is hard. In fact, quadratic drag is so hard. It's impossible to solve analytically. You have to solve it on a computer. And you'll learn why that's so complicated and such a pain on Wednesday morning. I'll let you guys go. So, all right, cool. See you then. Thanks for coming, by the way.